If you've got your Bibles, keep them open, Luke 10, 25 and following. And um, so Life Transforming Advocacy is the title I was given for this talk as part of your uh, Just Love series. Uh, I'll give it another title on top of that, which is Love Bites. Anyone got any love bites? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not talking the hickey variety. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll explain what uh, I mean by love bites. But I was, you know, sometimes you're, you're excited, sometimes you're a bit disappointed when you're given a passage. I, I, I'll confess to, you, you know, when you're given such a familiar passage, sometimes I think, oh, how can I say anything fresh? And yet, you, this is such a powerful passage, isn't it? And it's, it's, it's so powerful, and it's interesting how the Bible has suffused our culture. I mean, everyone knows about the Good Samaritan, and there's an organization called the Samaritans. And uh, as we look at this passage, verse 25, you've got an expert in the law, and he stood up to test Jesus. So he stood up to test Jesus. There are, there are a couple of other instances in the Gospels where someone asked this question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Some are more genuine than others. Here, it's, it's, not, it's not a neutral question. He is there. He's the doctrine police. He is here to, to test Jesus. And uh, so it's a bit like uh, Piers Morgan on, on an early morning TV, isn't it? Sort of getting in this straw man Christian just ready to trash him. Someone who's probably well-meaning and well-intentioned, but is not up to this task of sparring with a, with a very uh, bullying kind of uh, approach. And, and so that, that person invariably gets decimated. And, and that's the scenario here. And, you know, in the Gospels, it's interesting because Jesus asks way more questions than he provides answers to. In fact, he actually, he actually, to be precise, he, he, Jesus asks in, in the four Gospels 307 questions. He is asked 183 questions, of which he answers how many? So he's asked 182 questions. Shout out now. How many do you think he answers of, of those 183? Give it a guess. Five. That's good, yeah. I mean, it's actually, it depends. It's interesting. One, one source uh, said three, but it depends sometimes what a real answer is. So, so it's going to be less than 10. Less than 10 of the 183 questions he is asked, he answers. Normally, he, he replies with a question. That's what he does here. And actually, that might be a challenge to our apologetic, isn't it? If, pe if people just want to test us and want to catch us out so they can call you a, a bigot or intolerant or whatever, it's like, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not, I'm not bigoted, I'm not intolerant. Uh, please, please, uh, let's get behind the question and let's, let's speak, speak the truth in love to each other. But verse 25, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, straight away, do. Is that the right question? And uh, I'll come back to that. So just keep tracking with me. So, so, so Jesus then uh, takes in verse 26 to, to, to share territory. So what's written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? Uh, and the, the expert in the law gives a really good answer. Verse 27, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and all your mind and, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus knows where this is going, but he's, he's happy. And, and that's a good a summary of the Old Testament law that he's done there. So Jesus, he knows more is coming, so he replies, verse 28, well, good job, buddy, you've answered correctly, so just go and do this, and you will live. And of course, the more comes, verse 29, but the teacher in the law wanted to justify himself, and so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And that's where we get this famous parable that has so sort of suffused our culture, everyone knows the expression, the Good Samaritan, and and. If we were retelling it today, if Jesus was talking to us as Christians, he would probably choose a Muslim, wouldn't he? In my context in Burundi, if I was largely in a Hutu area, the Good Samaritan would have been a Tutsi. If you're in Northern Ireland, uh, you'd, you'd say this guy was a Catholic. If we were at the Conservative Party conference, this guy was Labour. If you were kill the bill, you know, whatever, all these different scenarios, it'd be the opposite to what you would think. I'm an Arsenal man, he would be Tottenham. And, you know, we've all got our different sort of tribalisms, haven't we? But this is, a, this is a person that you would not naturally think would do the right thing. So you've got the scenario, to, to quickly retell it, uh, a guy's heading on a journey. And, I've, I, you know, this is very, very real. The Bible's so real to me in Burundi because the, Burundi, the context and the culture is so like Bible times. 
you know, when you went up that hill to Jerusalem, and some of us have been to Israel, we've, we've done that road. Well, Burundi in the plain, Bujumbra, you're going up the hill to Bugarama. I've been on that road, 40 people getting killed. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's very real, the chance of being ambushed. And he heads up there, this guy gets duffed up, and then two respectable people walk past, don't they? You've got the priest, you've got the Levite, and they just go, ooh, oh, you know, that's, that's well, he's going to, touching him anyway is going to make me unclean, but that is an inconvenience to my schedule. I've got to get there, I've got to do that. But you would, I suppose you'd hope of anyone that a Levite and a priest would be people, good contenders to do the right thing. And then this beep of a person comes along and he does. He takes time. He touches the untouchable. He is willing to go the extra mile. That's again another phrase, isn't it, from the Bible. And so he picks him up, scoops him up, uh, takes him, leaves him in an inn, leaves money, says, I'll pay, the, pay more uh, when I return. And, and so that's the story. And Jesus concludes, verse 36, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And of course, the the teacher of the law knows the answer, doesn't he? But he, he can't bring himself to say Samaritan. So he just says the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. Now, all of us would have been like that teacher of the law. We all would have struggled to say the word of the person who represents all that we think of as the enemy. And you see, why am I, I call it love bites? And, and it's because Jesus' message has teeth. It's not slushy, mushy, sentimental love. It's, it's, you know, love is a verb. Love is an action. It's not reactive. It's proactive. It's countercultural. It's costly. It's radical. And the, the Good Samaritan is, is, is going the extra mile. He, he, he's actually embodying the Jesus message. It's so challenging because there has to be a cost in our love. It's not just about looking after our own. It's not just loving, lovable people. That's easy, isn't it? It's not loving our own tribe. Here's the deal. You could look at Sermon on the Mount, couldn't you? In Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 and following, Jesus said, you've heard it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Incidentally, I love uh, this beautiful Quaker saying, an enemy is one whose story I have not heard. An enemy is one whose story I have not heard. So Jesus says, you've heard that it was said, love your enemy, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Aren't even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than the others? Don't even the pagans do that? But be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Whew, the standard is high. Love bites. What does love with teeth really look like? I love the story of uh, Ortiz, Pastor Ortiz in Argentina. This is back in the 70s, uh, a, a very strongly Catholic country. Uh, pastor Ortiz was pastor of a, of a Pentecostal church, so a Protestant church, and it was exploding in growth. From, he went from 300 to 1,000. Nowadays, there are loads of mega churches out there, but at the time, it was the biggest church in Argentina. He was getting fated as the new hotshot mega church pastor in the country. Uh, looking back, he said, no, we just went from 300 to 1,000 largely unloving uh, Christians. But what happened was that one Sunday, he prepared his text. He's, he's, he's like, like when Martin preached, when I preached, we pray, we seek the Lord, we exegete the text, we, we try to do our homework, and then we come and we've got our message. And uh, so they've got 1,000 people in the church, including on the balcony, and the, the worship sets happened. And then uh, and he was just about to step forward to deliver his sermon, and the Spirit just nailed him in his seat. And he was sat there, and there was really awkward, stunned silence, and the worship leader's like, do I do another song? Uh, his, his wife up in the... Falcony's like, oh no, he's really lost it this time. Awkward sign. After two minutes, he steps forward to the pulpit and he just said, Love one another. And he went and st st sat back down again. Two minutes. Oh, long, awkward two minutes. After two minutes, he stepped forward again and he said, Love one another. A third time, another two minutes. He stepped forward and said, love one another. And someone in the front row then turned to their neighbor and said, is there anything I can do for you? 
And then these ripple conversations started taking place throughout the congregation. And he said that 28 people had come to church that morning unemployed, and 28 people left the church with a job. And he said that if he'd preached on the love of God, his previous sermon, people might have been edified and everything, but 28 people would still have left unemployed. He preached that same sermon for three months, during which time a lot of the church left. And he was like, I mean, he wasn't doing that, but he was like, good riddance. That's like, that's the the moaning, you know, grumblers. And they're, they're like, maybe they're thinking, it's legit. I'm not paying a pastor to chaffing saying, love one another every week. But he's like, go away, you groaners. We'll get down to the hardcore. And then after three months, he, he stepped forward. And he said, the Lord has given me a new word. And they all went, what? And he said, my new word is, love your neighbor as yourself. And by this stage, you see, they would got it. They didn't need and further messaging, they stood up, they left the building. And he said it was about Christmas time, they were wandering around the streets, and they had unwrapped, they had wrapped presents under their tree, and they started taking these presents, going down, giving them out to people, and then the church office began to be inundated with calls. Are you the church that loves people? Is, is this a church that cares about people? Love bites. Love has teeth. Is that who we are? Is that who we can dream and commit to being? With my wife's blessing a few years ago, I hired out a few prostitutes for the night. And uh, we met up. I'd, we'd built a conference center out there, so we met up at the hotel. And uh, I looked at these precious young ladies, 22, 23. And I sat down with them and said, um, I just want you to have the night off tonight. Go, go and have a shower, relax, stuff your face, sleep well. The deal is please just don't solicit any business from anyone else. And well, I'll come back in the morning and we can talk further if you want to leave this line of work. And I uh, came back the next day, prayed with my wife, went the next day and, and you know, what was their story? What do you think their story was? Do you think they were three years old and they were like dreaming, one day I'm going to be a prostitute? Is that how things work? Of course it's not, is it? They'd fallen through the cracks. They're both orphans. One was providing for six siblings. Maybe the Good Samaritan could have been a prostitute. But I know that in my head that we, you know, and I suspect most of us respectable people, if we walk past those precious ladies, sisters on the street, we could turn our nose up at them. We could look down at them. Um, but I, 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 I don't now because I've had an encounter with, with friends. They're friends. The lovely ongoing part of their story is that they now fathers of Jesus. One's married a pastor. They're both, you know, we set them up in business. Um, but, you know, we've all got prejudice, haven't we? And love bites. It has teeth. And the, the needs in the city are overwhelming. You think, where do we even start? But a picture's going to come up now. I want to tell a story of uh, my friend Anthony. And uh, look at me. I've got a bit more hair there. That's a, that's a number of years ago. Anthony used to come here even. Uh, I think he was more in Southfields because he's South African. The church, they're all there, aren't they? Uh, but uh, um, he, he used to come. Uh, I think he, we came a few times to this church. But I, I met Anthony on the back of a donkey in the Egyptian desert about 20 odd years ago. And uh, as we were walking, you know, trotting along on the donkey near the pyramids, I said, did, did you do all your schooling in South Africa? I said, yes, apart from three years at a prep school in Buckinghamshire. Like, what? Anthony Farr, he was my tennis partner when we were 11 years old. And I didn't recognize him because now he's this 18 stone number eight. And uh, that meeting changed his life. He changed his holiday plans, uh, came back here, did an alpha course at HTB, got radically saved, left merchant banking in the city to go back to South Africa to start a project that has impacted tens of thousands of orphans of AIDS. And that was one of them, Bongani. Um, so I was out preaching with, with Anthony, and uh, he said uh, we had a break in our schedule three days. He said, you know, there's a little kid I want you to meet. His dream is to see the sea before he dies. That's not a big dream, is it? And so we took him down. We drove six hours from Johannesburg down to Durban. That is Durban Beach. Now, Bongani wasn't much fun to be with because he was dying. The system was imploding. But, so we had three days. He hardly opened his mouth in those three days. But when he saw the sea, his eyes lit up. And we put on his swimming togs, and we paddled into the water. And then this great big crashing wave came, and he was bricking himself. So we got back out again. But we gave him his dream. 
And then we were driving back to Johannesburg, and it was the back of the truck, the bucky. I was, I, I was sat with him, and then he actually snuggled up into the crook of my neck because it was cold at nighttime, and he was to share a bit of body heat. And as he lay there, I, 10 years old, I listened to his sort of husky breathing, his snotty nose, husky lungs breathing as his system was slowly shutting down. And, and Anthony had flummoxed me with the question, what's God's purpose with Bongani's life? And in that moment, I was utterly broken. And I mean, he's dead now. What's God's purpose in Bongani's life? Well, he had a purpose in my life. And as you listen right now, he can have a purpose in your life because it's so easy to batten down the hatches and look after ourselves. And there's so many problems out there and I don't want to engage. But Jesus is saying, love bites. Get your hands dirty. And Anthony, the project that he'd started was called Starfish. And some of you know the Starfish story, but let me tell it quickly. There's been a storm and, and, and thousands of starfish being washed out of the on, out of the water onto the shore and a starfish out of water is going to die so you've got this little boy in his, in his youthful zeal and he's wandering along and he's picking them up one at a time and he's wanging them back in uh, and, uh, but hey there's stack loads of them and, and, and so what's the point and that's exactly what some cynical old man came up to him and said hey little boy give up look there's thousands of them what's the point what, you know, you're wasting your time what difference can you make and that little boy listened respectfully and then he bent over and he picked another one out and he and he said, well, it made a difference for that one, didn't it? So simple, but so powerful. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege you've given me of wanging back in several hundred thousand starfish in Burundi and beyond. But it's not about the numbers game, is it? It's about being faithful to the call of God on your life, whether you're in the arts or media or politics, or education, or entertainment, as, as, as parents, as grandparents, in whatever sphere, as students, where he's put us, he wants to use you. Love bites. And never doubt, people, listen up, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. That's quoting Margaret Mead. I'm living that in Burundi. We've had a nation-shaping involvement. Our strapline, well, at GLOW, what do we do? We identify, empower, equip the best local leaders of passion, integrity, gifting, and vision for the transformation of the nation, bottom up and top down. We're doing it. It's been costly. It's long term. But please, no one say, I'm just this, I'm just that. I can't make a difference. What difference can you make? One at a time. We are not a statistic. Each of us picked out the toilet. Every person on the street, God longs for them to come into relationship with him. And it was Edmund Burke who said that all that it takes for evil to prosper is for good people to do nothing. And there's a lot of good people around, too many of whom are doing nothing. And that's not an accusation, but it is a challenge if you need it. It was Martin Niemüller in the professing, Confessing Church in uh, the Second World War in, in Germany, and he spent uh, a decent number of years imprisoned eventually for his faith, but he toned it down, and we're all about toning it down. That's my observation in our country right now. The church, we're on the back foot. We're toning it down. We've got to stop toning it down. And he said this first... The Nazis came for the communists. I didn't speak out for the communists because I wasn't a communist. And then they came for the socialists, and I didn't speak up for the socialists because I wasn't a socialist. And then they came for the labor leaders, and I didn't speak up for the labor leaders because I wasn't a labor leader. And then they came for the Jews. I didn't speak up for the Jews because I wasn't a Jew. And then they came for me. And there was no one left to speak up for me. One harried vicar, and Martin, don't feel picked on at all. This could be anyone, but this is, this is just a powerful story. He was so busy, and he walked past this, um, 
this, this homeless lady who was needing help, and he sort of fobbed her off, as I think we've all done, uh, with a promise to pray for her, and that, you know, he was just too busy. And, and she wrote the following poem and gave it to a, a local shelter office, officer. She wrote this, I was hungry, and you formed a humanities group to discuss my hunger. I was imprisoned, and you crept off quietly to your chapel and prayed for my release. I was naked, and in your mind you debated the morality of my appearance. I was sick, and you knelt and thanked God for your health. I was homeless, and you preached a sermon on the spiritual shelter of the love of God. I was lonely, and you left me alone to pray for me. And you seem so holy, so close to God. But I am still very hungry and lonely and cold. Last story as we come into land. It was in an African village. A, a house during the night was burnt down and lots of shrieking of those of the family members caught inside and actually everyone died, everyone's burnt. Apart from at the last minute, someone managed to reach through the ground floor and pluck out the baby boy. And the next day, the whole village gathered around the smoldering embers of that house, and a heated discussion took place about who would have the right to adopt that boy, because obviously there was, he was favored. The, the, according to the worldview, the ancestors, ancestral spirits had protected him, so there was baraka, there was blessing to be had. And so, you know, so the witch doctor's like, this boy has got special psychic powers that I need to nurture, so let me adopt him. And the richest man in the village said, no, you know, I can pay for him to get the best education. And the chief said, no, I'm the chief. And the neighbor said, no, his father had an unpaid debt towards me, so I'll take the baby in lieu of that payment. And, and, and then this, anybody, random guy, nobody special, just stepped forward, but quite authoritatively said, no, the boy, the baby boy is mine. And they're like, what? What's your claim? And he didn't say much. He just opened his hands. And his hands were blistered and burnt and charred. And he said, the boy is mine because I saved him. And Jesus this morning says to you, says to you online, as you're just checking out this thing, he says, you're mine. I love you. That much. Come. You're mine. I saved you. I paid that price. I love you so much. Don't hold me at arm's length anymore. Receive me. Receive me. It was Austrian philosopher Ivan Illich. He was asked whether it was more effective to change society through violent revolution or gradual reform. And he replied, neither. If you want to change society, you must tell an alternative story. So here's to telling the best alternative story in the world which is Jesus has died in my place that I can be free and I can start life now, no longer shackled by guilt and shame and all the bad choices I've made. That, yes, there are consequences of those choices, but I can live. Behold, all things I make all things new. So actually, that expert, he came along. He had the wrong question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Dude, it's the wrong question. I mean, it's what must I be to inherit eternal life? And actually, maybe Jesus is the question. As well as the answer. However, you want to unpack that one. So not, what's, not, not, what's, not what must I do, but what must I be? You must be humble. I've got things wrong, Lord. I don't know all the answers. Maybe I've been asking the wrong questions. I must be teachable. Okay, Lord, there's areas of my life that need addressing. There are changes that need to be made. You must be 
ready to repent, to say sorry. And as I close in prayer, literally now in, in, in 90 seconds, be ready. I'm just going to offer you the chance, if you've never made that choice, uh, to, to, to say, I'm sorry, and I want to start this journey with you. That's what we're going to do. Well, it could be for the umpteenth time. Daily repentance, that's what we need. I must be reconciled with others, with God. I must be free. I must be forgiven. I must be accepted. I must be white clean. I can be adopted into his family. I can be commissioned to join him in changing the world one at a time. Hallelujah. I mean, what a great message. That's the good news. And so Jesus' last words to us. Look at that verse. He just said, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise, brothers and sisters. Otherwise, we're wasting our time. Love bites. It has teeth. It's not slush. It costs. So as I close, honestly, I've addressed you today. Have I wasted my time? Are we wasting God's time? Are you going to waste your time? Because now is the time.